The Arleigh Burke class destroyer is the backbone of the United States Navy due to its unparalleled versatility, upgradability, sheer numbers, and proven reliability. These destroyers excel in various warfare arenas, including anti-air, anti-submarine, and anti-surface combat. Crucially, Arleigh Burks have been designed for adaptability. Their modular construction allows for upgrades with new technologies and weapons, ensuring they remain at the cutting edge of naval capability for decades. The US Navy operates a vast fleet of these destroyers, allowing a global presence and a flexible response to emerging threats. Serving aboard an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, one of the most powerful and technologically advanced warships in the US Navy, offers a unique blend of challenges and rewards that shape the daily lives of its crew members. These ships, designed for a variety of missions from peacekeeping to high-intensity warfare, provide a platform where sailors are constantly tested, both personally and professionally. Of course, the American Navy always wants to take the most advanced and equipped ships into its inventory. However, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt Jr. had another approach to this matter. So, in order to understand how Arleigh Burke destroyers came to be, we must first discuss his high-low mix philosophy. The problem with an all-high navy was that it would be so costly that there would be too few ships to control the seas. The problem with an all-low navy was that even if enough ships could be built, they would not be capable of dealing with specific threats or performing specific missions. In order to have both strength and numbers, there had to be a mix of highs and lows. So just like the $300 million Virginia-class nuclear-powered guided missile cruisers were supplemented by a larger, low-mix fleet of $50 million Perry-class frigates, the Aegis-equipped Ticonderoga cruisers were the high-mix platform that needed to be supplemented by a low-cost surface combatant. Enter Arleigh Burke. But of course, like everything else, the birth of this ship class was a duel between politicians and the Navy. Although the budget was tight, the requirements were high. The Arleigh Burke class had to be able to operate independently, in rough seas, for long periods of time, and with speeds in excess of 30 knots. This new low-mix destroyer class was to be multi-mission surface combatants and should be able to deploy forward for independent operations, contributing to power projection with its offensive capabilities. It also had to pull this off in the face of a variety of threats. Despite all of these tough expectations, they had to be at least 50 feet shorter with a maximum displacement of 8,300 tons, have one gun instead of two, have a smaller missile capacity, and have no helicopter hangars. In order to fulfill the speed requirement, despite the limitations dictated by the reduced hull length, the design team upgraded the gas turbines and designed a new water plane area hull with a wide bow that resulted in a unique shape that was nicknamed Ali Brick. While some compromises had to be made due to political constraints, the designers had to draw a red line in certain areas, so except for two aluminium funnels, the entire ship is made from steel, with vital areas protected by two layers of steel and 70 tons of Kevlar armor. This ship class has been constructed in flights to accommodate technological advances. The design approach, which was more focused on the ship's cost than its military capabilities, changed in 1997 when the construction of the 34 Flight 2A destroyers began. 
Flight 2A destroyers were 4 feet longer and 1,000 tons heavier than the previous flights. But the biggest addition was the dual helicopter hangars to accommodate two SH-60Bs. One of the most distinctive features of life on an Arleigh Burke class destroyer is the engagement with cutting edge technology such as Aegis. Operating such a system requires a high level of skill and concentration, and sailors take pride in mastering this sophisticated technology, which is crucial for mission success. The Aegis system has a federated architecture with four subsystems, ANSPY-1 multifunction radar, a command and decision system, or CDS, an Aegis display system, or ADS, and the weapon control system, WCS. Unlike the traditional rotating radars, the phased array SPY-1 radars can provide real-time 360-degree coverage, enabling them to establish fire control quality track on incoming missiles up to four times the speed of the former. On top of all this, Aegis destroyers are equipped with an automated detect-to-engage sequence, which further reduces the manual firing sequence response time. Another revolutionary part of the Aegis combat system is the Vertical Launch System, or VLS, that allows for a firing rate of about one missile per second and supports a large variety of missile types. The Aegis weapon system, which integrates onboard radars with other sensors, like the ones on satellites, combines weapons such as VLS and CIWS and unifies the communications and human interface into a highly automated system. The new version, Flight 3, is nearly bow-to-stern redesigned. It has a displacement of 9,700 tons, enabling the installation of a new Aegis baseline, 10 combat systems and an electric plant. The Arleigh Burke class Flight 3 destroyers pack a serious punch, building on the already impressive weapon systems found on earlier versions of the ship. They carry over proven core systems like the Vertical Launch System, or VLS, allowing them to launch a mix of missiles for anti-aircraft, anti-submarine and land attack missions. You'll also find the 5-inch deck gun for engaging surface targets or bombarding the shore, and the Phalanx Close-In Weapon System, or CIWS, for automated defense against incoming missiles. Where Flight 3 really stands out are its upgrades. The new AN Spy 6 V1 radar is incredibly powerful, spotting targets further away and allowing the ship to handle many more threats at once. This boost is crucial for ballistic missile defense. Flight 3s also have the latest Aegis combat system to manage this increased sensor data and weaponry. Block 3's bulky midsection was in part designed so that future upgrades could be incorporated into the destroyers. What's exciting is the potential for future weapons integration. Flight 3 ships have the space and power to potentially carry hypersonic missiles, offering a huge boost in offensive capability. There's also the possibility of them using directed energy weapons like lasers in the future. Additionally, the latest Block 3 Arleigh Burks feature a powerful upgrade in their electrical systems. While these ships come with a hefty price tag of approximately $2 billion each, this investment is considered crucial. The Navy supplies around half the cost of equipment, and the remaining cost reflects the incredible capabilities these destroyers bring to the fleet. With rapidly evolving naval threats, having these advanced warships in service quickly is seen as essential to maintaining U.S. naval dominance. Yeah. 
Stepping onto an Arleigh Burke class destroyer is like entering an entirely different world. The sleek grey hull, bristling with antennas and weapon systems, hints at the power and complexity within. As you cross the gangway, you leave behind the familiar and step into a realm of steel, technology and close-knit community unlike any other. The ship becomes your home, but it's a home that's constantly in motion. The steady hum of engines and generators forms the background soundtrack of your life. The rhythm punctuated by the occasional clang or rumble of machinery. Space is a luxury you learn to live without. Corridors are narrow, berthing spaces are stacked, and every inch of the ship is crammed with equipment, pipes, and cables. Privacy becomes something you snatch in brief moments, often in the dim glow of your bunk after a long watch. Your days are dictated by a relentless tempo of work, drills, and watch standing. There's an endless list of maintenance tasks, systems to test, and gear to inspect. Drills, fire, man overboard, flooding, are constant reminders that the sea is both your workplace and a potential adversary. When the call to battle stations sounds, it's not a simulation. The adrenaline surges as you rush to your post, knowing that the decisions you make and the actions you take have real-world consequences. The crew is your family, bound together by shared hardship and the unwavering need to trust one another. You might not like everyone on board, but you rely on them and they on you. Friendships form quickly in the intensity of shipboard life, forged in the shared experience of long deployments, midnight watches, and the occasional liberty port. Jokes, inside stories, and unique shipboard language create a sense of belonging, making the massive warship feel a little more like home. Out at sea, especially at night, the world shrinks down to your ship and the endless expanse of stars and water. Standing watch on the bridge wing, the wind whipping at your face, you feel both insignificant and profoundly powerful. Insignificant in the face of the ocean's vastness, yet powerful because you wield the might of a warship, a floating city capable of projecting force across the globe. Serving on an Arleigh Burke is tough, demanding, and relentlessly challenging. It's long hours, missed holidays, and the strain of being away from loved ones. Yet, it's also a place of intense camaraderie, unwavering professionalism, and the profound pride of knowing you are part of something bigger than yourself. A vital cog in the machinery of the most powerful navy in the world. Decades of active service have proven Arleigh Burke's reliability and endurance in all conditions. They are designed for extended deployments and can project power far from home. With evolving roles in areas like hypersonic missile defense, Arleigh Burke's continued modernization ensures it will remain a vital component of the US Navy for years to come. This concludes our episode that provides a glimpse into Arleigh Burke class destroyers. So, what do you think about these ships? What other pieces of military hardware would you like us to cover in our future episodes? Also, if you were lucky enough to see one of the ships mentioned in this video up close, or better yet, served in one, please comment. Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.